So this morning, we're talking about trust during the storm. Trust during the storm. Anybody here ever get, ever get caught up in a brutal storm? A snowstorm, a rain, rain showers, thunderstorm? Yeah, okay, some of you guys. When I was a kid, I was, well, I was 17 years old. No, hang on. Volkswagen Golf. Yeah, 17 years old. And uh, we lived in the country, okay? Out in the sticks. And uh, as we were living in the country, you know, I was like... 45 minutes or so out of town. So any time that I had to go into the city, you know, it was a long drive there, long drive back. And you know, you're 17, you like your freedom, you like to kind of do your thing. And so, uh, you know, it's an evening and I go out in the winter time all the way out to Winnipeg and uh, it's time to get home. It's, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I'm driving down the highway from Winnipeg to where we lived way out in the country. And, uh, and the snow is getting worse and worse and worse, and it's coming down so viciously and ferociously to the point where I couldn't see just a few feet in, my, in front of my car. And you know, when you, you know when it's like a bad snowstorm and you flick on your high beams and you feel like you're in Star Wars? You know, it's like everything's just coming at you and you're traveling at light speed. It was like that in low beams, so you know how bad it was. It was not a good situation. And, uh, and I didn't know what was gonna happen. So you gotta understand, diesel, little diesel car, it's not going to start again at 45 below with the wind howling if I have to turn it off. If I manage to hit the ditch, um, it's going to be a bad day because no one's going to find me because no one else is driving. And I started getting a little bit freaked out. And I'm just, Kate, I've just got my foot on the fuel and I'm just going ahead and I'm pushing through the snow and the highways are piling up uh, and it's getting pretty slidey and it's so, so frigidly cold outside. I just wanted to get home. And out of this fear... I realized if I get stuck out here, if you're not used to 45 below, it doesn't take long for you to turn into a popsicle at all. And I thought, and you know, teenager, not well dressed for winter time. And uh, I thought, man, I'm not going to, it's not going to be good. So I had kind of the fear set in. But at 17, I remembered a story from when I was young that my Bible teacher taught me when I was just nothing but trouble. Uh, and it's the story about when Jesus calms the storm. And all I remembered is that Jesus had authority over the storm, and in turn, he also granted us his authority when he went to be in heaven. And so I, I just, it was a Hail Mary, not really, it was a praise Jesus, but uh, there's a couple, yeah, it's fine. So as I'm cruising along and the snow's coming down so bad, I, I didn't know what else to do except yell out these words, Someone's car alarm. I yell out these words, in the name of Jesus, storm be calm. And just like this, just like that, the snow stopped falling. It was a crystal clear sky and I continued driving home. It was the craziest thing that I've ever experienced in my entire life at that moment. It was wild and it was kind of jarring. And I was even wrestling with, do I even believe in God at this point in my life? I was really wrestling with what I believed in, whether I could trust in God, whether God was even real. I didn't really know where I even landed. And in all of that, there was still authority in the name of Jesus in the midst of the storm that we face. Let's start off here with Psalm chapter 46, verse 1 to 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear... Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Let's go back to the beginning of that. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you touch our hearts this morning. If we're going through seasons that are stormy right now, if we're in the thick of it right now, or we can see the storm approaching, I just ask, Lord, that you remind us today where we can anchor to, who we can trust in, where our help and our hope comes from. Let that settle into our hearts today, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. So, do we have any pictures of the Sea of Galilee? Where's the, where's the pictures? Let's throw those up there really quick. Are they up there? Oh, oh. Okay, great. So it kind of looks like the Okanagan, hey? This is the Sea of Galilee. And uh, yeah, just take, pause it there for a second. It's the Sea of Galilee all the way over in Israel. Um, it's a, it, they call it a sea, but it's a very, it's, a, it's like a little lake. 
It's not very big. It's pretty small. That boat right there is called the Moses. <laughs> it just, it's kind of funny. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of a beautiful sort of palm tree kind of desert setting and nice green hills in the background. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And, uh, oh, there's Maria and Gabby just kind of taking a look uh, out over the, the landscape there. And it, it's a pretty neat body of water. It is not very large. It's way smaller than we would expect it to be. But the way that it's situated is it's situated north to south, and it's in a valley called the Jordan Rift. And the wind, when it comes through there, it picks up so quickly, so instantly, that suddenly things get tumultuous very, very quickly. We can go to the next slide. This is really cool. So, uh, Somebody was fishing in the Sea of Galilee, probably those fishermen at the very beginning, first picture I showed you, and they're just, you know, doing their thing, fishing in the water, and they snag on to something that's not moving, and then they finally give it a big yank, and, and they pull to the surface a chunk of wood, and they're like, what on earth is this chunk of wood? And so as they're looking at this chunk of wood, they think, well, maybe something's down there. And so they sent a dive team down, and they took a peek at it, and then what ended up being is the hull of an old fishing vessel. So they put up a weir wall around it uh, with these iron posts, and then they pumped out the hole where this boat was in, and they sent a team down into the pits down below, and they started excavating and cleaning up, but they realized we can't lift this thing out. We can't get it out of the water. What are we going to do? So you can go to the next slide. So what they did is they wrapped this entire old boat, the hull of that old ship, in plastic, and then they spray foamed the entire exterior of the whole boat. So it's spray foamed and fill up. You guys have seen that yellow spray foam stuff. And as it, they sprayed it with spray foam, they let it cure, and then they started letting the water back in. And as the water started coming back in, this ship that sunk 2,000 years ago, that's right, it's 2,000 years old, this ship rose to the surface, and they floated it across the Sea of Galilee to the museum where they began the restoration process to put it back for people to see. Now they built a skeleton out of stainless steel uh, mounts and ribs, and twice a day, every single day, they run uh, this little device over top of it that sprays it with formalin so that the wood just doesn't turn to dust and disappear. And what's so crazy is that boat was a common sight to see at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. There was many boats that sank at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. And so when we look at this next passage of Scripture, we are going to understand very quickly why everyone was afraid, why the folks in the boat with Jesus were afraid, because these storms were so commonplace as they ripped up from south to north and they caused this calm, beautiful sea to become so tumultuous that it was taking down ships left, left, right, and center, there was good reason why they were afraid. So let's take a look at this passage. Mark chapter 4, 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Now, across to the other side, it's a short little trip to go from one side of the Galilee to the next. It's very small. But let's go for a little boat ride, he says to them. And leaving the crowd of people, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were also with them. And a great windstorm rose across the lake, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. It, the storms there become crazy, and they happen so quickly. But he was in the stern, having a snooze on the cushion. And they woke him, and when he awoke, they said, sorry, they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? We're going to die, is what they're saying. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Let's go to the next picture there. I think it shows the um, picture of the... Oh, no, next one. Uh, there we go. So this is kind of a picture across the Sea of Galilee. And on the far right-hand side, we've got a storm brewing. 
And it got crazy. Now, we had to get off the water because it was so stormy. But that storm got crazy, crazy enough that it absolutely could have flipped the boats. And it happened in an instant. Without warning, the waves come in, and it starts crashing against the shore, and everything that's out on the water is absolutely going to be down at the bottom of the lake in no time. The storm that these disciples faced was a common occurrence to everybody around them in their society. And they didn't really know what to do in the midst of it except for, we need to get off the water or we're going to sink and drown. The disciples had a fear. It was a common fear. It was the reality that they were in the thick of it and of their own strength, power, ability, and with the equipment they had at their disposal, they did not have an adequate escape route to get to a safe space. They knew that they were probably going to die in the storm. The folks who lifted up that boat that sunk 2,000 years ago That boat was on the surface of that water right around the time that Christ was walking the earth. And it sank to the bottom right in the midst of one of these storms. Their fear was justified because they knew what could happen to them. But isn't that the case with everything we face in life right now? Whether we're facing political storms, whether we're facing financial storms, whether we're facing relational or family storms, maybe we're just dealing with trying to figure out how to get through this week because this week alone is just so insurmountable in our eyes. But what happened is they called on Jesus. Jesus came out and he rebuked the storm. It was calm instantly And he says to them, why are you so afraid? Where's your faith? Christ has authority over the storm that we see outlined in this passage of Scripture, but he also has authority over the storms in our life and in our circumstances. Anybody going through a storm right now? Yeah. Some of us are going through a storm right now. But our reaction to it could be one of freaking out and being terrified and hiding away and covering ourselves up or pretending it doesn't exist. The other reaction we can have is to stand firm in the midst of it because we know that Christ is there with us and he will carry us through. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 to 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, because your own understanding is going to tell you, this boat's going to sink. It's time to get out. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. So often... We think because of our circumstances being upset and we're not exactly sure what to do, we clamor and grab for any single thing that could possibly make sense to us. Because there's this peace inside of us that wrestles when it comes to trusting in Christ beyond what we can understand. There's part of our nature that wants to abstain from practicing faith and rather rush towards practicing panic. I don't know what your situations have been like or what you're dealing with today, but ask yourself the question, am I walking in faith, trusting in my creator? Or is it easier for me to panic and be afraid and rush towards my way of trying to fix things? But what happens when our way of fixing things does not repair the problem? What happens when that's the case? What do we do? Well, we're at the end of ourselves. And and I think so often we come across our own situations or other people's situations where the issues truly are insurmountable. We can't fix them. There's nothing that we can do or apply to the situation that actually fixes the problem. So we have to get above the problem. We have to transcend the issue. We have to be beyond it and outside of it. But can we do that on our own? No, we have limitations of time and space. But the one who doesn't is our Lord and Savior. 
The one who has no limitations in these areas is our creator, God. And what's wonderful and amazing is God can do more in a microsecond than we can do in a millennia. It's the truth. But rarely do we just simply lay down our circumstances before him, call out to him, and trust him. We frantically want to try to hold it all together. Meanwhile, he may actually have a lesson for us in the midst of the storm that we're in. Trusting in God's plan is crucial. It's all about, Christ's plan is always, 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 always all about redemption, reconciliation, repentance, restoration. His process of walking us through this might seem challenging to us, but I promise you it is always for our betterment. God works all things together together for the good of those who love him. Our situations, as challenging as they may appear to us on the surface, are likely an opportunity for us to grow and to learn and to trust and have faith. Jesus said at the very beginning here, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? As his friends and disciples and onlookers were watching over and over and over again what he was accomplishing, what he was doing, what he was teaching, And still, when they were caught in the thick of it, they didn't know how to respond. They didn't know that there was opportunity to call out for help. They didn't know that Christ was going to give them the very tools they needed for the storms that they were facing. They were still in the midst of it, but with Christ, they had opportunity to have hope during the storm. Again, I don't know what your storm looks like today, but we also have to choose to trust in God's provision through the storm. That means provision for a way out. That means provision for our needs. That means provision for, our, for wisdom in how to walk through challenging situations. If he can provide for the birds of the air and clothe the lilies in splendor, how can he not provide for you? How can he not meet your very needs in the midst of what you're going through. You're precious to him. God loves you deeply and profoundly, and he will always, always meet your needs. What are your needs today? I want to encourage you that you can bring these things before God. You can bring your needs before him. He might not cover all your wants. I know some of you are like, oh, flipping through the magazines. There's a hovercraft. I think maybe... I want a hovercraft, a personal one that I could ride around on the water. That'd be so fantastic. Probably God's not going to provide you with your wants for your hovercraft. But he will always, absolutely and completely always meet your needs. What are your actual needs? If he can clothe the lilies in splendor and he can feed the birds of the air that don't have to toil or work, how much more important are you than these things? God will absolutely and always meet your needs. So trust him in that. Additionally, trust in God's presence. The word promises us that he will never leave us or forsake us. We might stray away. We might leave and walk away and wander in the wilderness, but he is always there. He is constant. He is unchanging. He is waiting for us to come back to him and surrender to him like the prodigal son did. The prodigal son disappears off, burns through the inheritance, ends up prostituting out his life, wants to eat the slop that the pigs are eating. He has no other options in front of him. He is at the lowest point in his life and figures, you know what, maybe I can just go and work for my dad. It has to be better than the life that I'm living. I am living in squalor. And I'm sure he's expecting to receive every single thing that he deserves from his earthly father as he goes back and says, I'm sorry, I burned through all the money. I've been a useless son. I haven't respected or honored or obeyed your rules that you have set out for me, and I have just run for the hills, but I've realized my ways 
are not as good as your ways. And as he approaches his father, his father welcomes him with open arms, ministers to him, clothes him, puts a robe upon him, and has a feast for him because there's joy in returning back to the fold. That is a picture of our lives with our heavenly father. We stray off often, but he is waiting for us to return. He's waiting for us to say, not my will, God, but your will be done. It says in the word that he'll be with us always, even to the end of the age. And regarding his presence, look around you. Go outside today. Have a peek around at the mountains and the sky and the snow-capped peaks. Go for a drive in the evening and appreciate the wilderness that you see as you weave through Pass Creek and the other country roads around here. The beauty of God's creation speaks to his splendor. It speaks to his presence. And this beautiful picture of changing season that we have in front of us reminds us that, yes, this too shall pass. Perhaps you are in the midst of the storm, or you're just coming out of it, or you can recognize that one is definitely coming. I want to encourage you this morning to not be afraid of it. Because as you go through the storm, there's opportunity for your faith to grow. There's opportunity for you to trust incredibly in the power of our living Savior. And what's amazing is that on the other side, we can remember that this too shall pass. Last point, Jesus is with us in the storm. Isaiah 43 says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they won't overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Think about your situations that you're going through right now. Maybe you're doing great, but you have somebody close to you who's really struggling. What kind of encouraging words can you bless them with as you lend your hope and lend your faith out free of charge, no interest? How can you encourage them, or how can you be encouraged in this moment? Well, it says here in the word that when you pass through it, when you go through it, when you are in the midst of it, I will be with you. You are not alone. You might feel alone right now. No one's reaching out to me. No one's connecting with me. I have nobody to talk to. No one's here with me. I want to encourage you. That is a beautiful place to be in. Why? Because it fosters a strong relationship with your creator. Perhaps you've chosen to trust in so many other things rather than your creator. It's time to get back to him. And that's not a bad thing. It can seem unnerving because so often we self-medicate our situations with filling them with things. Whether it's more conversations, more people, more activities, more stuff. Let's add it to the list so we don't have to deal with our situations. I just spent a weekend out in the forest so I didn't have to clean my kitchen. It's a real thing. But when you're in the midst of it and you might feel alone, I want you to know you are not abandoned. God brings us through seasons that are wildly tough. He allows us to go through these things so that we can be robust believers on the other side. Not losing our faith because we stubbed our toe or stepped on some Lego. God, where are you? It's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're nursing your poor foot. No, God allows us to go through things to become robust believers. Tough feet for the hard ground we walk on, but soft hearts as we care for others. This is what our beautiful, wonderful, amazing creator brings us through as his children. He teaches us and equips us and encourages us. And though it might be challenging in the moment, I promise you, you will be better for it on the other side. You might feel alone right now, but you are not alone. God is with you, and he loves you and has compassion for you, but he's waiting for you to turn back to him. 
He's waiting for you to call back out to him. He's waiting for you to be like that prodigal son that strayed but returns. He actually wants to bring you in with open arms and help you grow. He is with you. He is present in the storm. He is your comforter in the storm. And ultimately, he delivers you from the storm. I like it says in John chapter 16, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have struggles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I'm going to read that again, and I want you to pay attention and let that sink in. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. That means in Christ you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. I don't like the sound of that, Jesus. It sounds like I might have some struggles. Yes, you will. Jesus died on a cross. We're probably also going to have some struggles. But get this. Take heart, he says. I have overcome the world. See, the reality of storms is that we will all face them. Every single one of us will see or experience a storm in our lifetimes. But they're necessary because they bring rain. The wind stirs up and and causes, uh, causes fertilization of different plants to occur. It brings snow and precipitation into dry areas. It cleans the dust off the ground. It carries birds, different areas that they need to go. There are storms that we will face, but they're so necessary in the seasons of life that we're going in. So why don't we start shifting our gears a little bit and look at the storm for what it is? If we look at the storm and have a pity party, you think, oh, poor me, God hates me, no one loves me, I'm just alone, it's all terrible. Sure, you can look at it like that. It's a sad outlook on life. But if we switch gears and look at things through a bit of a different lens, we can see the storms that we face as an opportunity to grow in faith in God. When, I, when, I, uh, when I'm kind of in the thick of it and I'm feeling like, you know, you get, you get big storms in life and then you get the crazy rainstorms that hit really, really suddenly and then they're gone in a moment. When I get those moments... I I often find myself going to bed praying like I've never prayed before, waking up in the middle of the night praying like I've never prayed before, and waking up in the morning praying like I've never prayed before, driving in my truck to work praying like I've never prayed before, going to go and meet people praying like I've never prayed before. In the midst of the storm, my prayer life is better than it's ever been ever before in the history of my existence. And you know what? The storm doesn't change. It's still happening all around me. But man, do I ever feel connected with the Lord. And when I realize that he's still with me, even in the storm, he hasn't left me or forsaken me, "Ah, it's just another storm. There'll be another one next week. Maybe a couple months from now, I'm going to get a big one. No big deal. The situation and the circumstance doesn't change at all. But I have peace in it. How can I have peace in it? Well, Jesus says, I've said these things to you that in me, you will have peace. You're going to have struggles in the world, yes, but take heart. I've overcome these things. Our prayer life in the midst of our circumstances doesn't necessarily change our circumstance, but it changes our hearts. And I think we all need a bit of a heart change now and then. So the reality of storms is that we all face them. Worship team, you can come up. But what's beautiful is that in Christ we have the promise of peace. God's word, our times of prayer, as we forget what is behind us and press on towards him, he becomes our anchor in the midst of it. And what's amazing is we have this final bit of promise that we see at the end of chapter 16, verse 33 in John. It says, take heart. I have overcome the world. You will have tribulation in the world, but I have overcome the world. There is the hope that we all have, the hope of victory 
in Christ Jesus. And that's not just my hope. That is your hope. And if you're here today and you're scratching your head and you're like, I don't know, my situation is just a little bit too tough to just pray about. I want to challenge you this morning to actually pray about it. To actually stop everything. Stop what you are doing. Take your phone. Lock it away somewhere. Turn your TV off. Throw your remotes outside. Unplug everything if you have to. Take your modem or whatever they have nowadays. I don't know. what they still have modems? Whatever they have for internet, unplug that from the wall. Turn on some soft music in the background so you can get into a place of not worrying about the distractions around you and actually go to God with everything that's going on in your life. Actually do it. Don't think about doing it. Don't talk about doing it. Go and do it. And I promise you what you'll experience, and I'm telling you this because I do this too, I promise what you will experience is you will experience God bringing peace upon the chaos that's in your situation. You will experience that. Your situation may not change, but your outlook upon it and where your eyes are fixed upon, that begins to change. We had a car crash just down our street not too long ago. And uh, it was quite interesting. I was driving the kids down to school and at the bottom of our hill, the highway happens and left way goes to town and right way goes to not town. And the way that goes to not town, there's a Jeep that hit a telephone pole. Everyone was fine, no major injuries, it's good. The Jeep was kind of tipped over, it was in the snow. And of all the space that this person could have hit, out of all the 500 feet between the telephone poles, he managed to hit the telephone pole of all things. Why? My daughter asked me, why does he hit the telephone pole? I said, it's a strange phenomenon. But you will absolutely drive directly into the thing that you're looking at. The thing that you're focusing on. And as you're cruising on the highway and you start losing control and you think, oh, I can't hit that telephone pole. I can't hit that telephone pole. I can't hit that telephone pole. Hit the telephone pole. Almost every single time you will make contact with what you are steering towards what you are looking at. You will go the direction of where your focus is fixed. If your focus is constantly fixed on the telephone pole in the midst of your vehicle going out of control, you are going to hit that pole. Same for your situations. If your focus is fixed on the obstacles that are in front of you, if your focus is fixed on the chaos of the storm, if your focus is fixed on every single thing that could possibly go wrong, you have utterly and totally lost sight of the one who's above these things. And that's the Lord. What are your eyes fixed upon today? Are your eyes stuck looking at your situation? Are your feelings and emotions buried in a place of feeling like you aren't loved or you aren't cared for and nobody sees you? I want to encourage you this morning to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And when we fix our eyes upon Christ, he will make our path straight. He will minister to us and help guide us through the storm. He will come and comfort us while we are in the thick of it And he'll make a place for us to rest even in the midst of our enemies. Why don't you stand this morning? We're going to end in worship and I want to encourage you to take some time to pray as we're going through this last song here. Ask yourself the question, God, am I really going through it right now? And he's going to say, yeah, you might be. But what's amazing is he gives us the opportunity right now to turn to him. So this morning, maybe like it's brand new, maybe like it's the first time ever, 
I want to encourage you right now to give it to Jesus and fix your eyes upon him. Jesus, we come before you as your church this morning. Forgive us, Lord, for the times where we've ran the other direction, where we've chased after every single other thing to try to heal and fix our wounds and our hearts. Forgive us for our attitudes and our actions in the midst of the storm, Lord. Forgive us for the lack of faith. Help us, God, this morning. Help us with our unbelief. Help us with our struggles in faith. Help us in the midst of the storm, Lord. Help us to remember to turn our eyes to you. This morning, God, we choose to turn our eyes to you, to make you our focus, not our situations, not our circumstances. We choose to make you our focus. This morning, Lord, we come before you and we surrender to you. And we say, not our will, but may yours be done. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen.